I actually discuss some of the myths about homosexuality. Why, why, don't you, why don't you cover just a couple of those here? For example, David and Jonathan, you know, uh, are gay, they, they will say, the world says. And I walk through how do we interpret the Bible well? As, as your watchers and listeners know, context is king. But here's the thing. A lot of times we don't sometimes, lady, don't sometimes realize that there are different aspects of context. For example, there is literary context, looking at kind of the verses and the chapters around. There is also historical context that isn't then looking at the verses around it. It's actually looking at, well, when was this book written and who is the author? What was the author dealing with? What was the audience dealing with? That's historical context. But the third one is often missed and it's canonical context. So in other words, when I read this verse, I'm reading it in light of all of the whole Bible, all 66 books of the Bible, not just that one book that, that that we find this verse in, but looking at it in, reading in the light of Genesis, in light of Revelation, in light of Acts, in light of Malachi, Isaiah, etc., the whole Bible, because Scripture interprets Scripture. Scripture affirms Scripture. And this, I think, is one of the main things that people who twist scripture, they don't do. I have not met a single revisionist that actually reads the Bible canonically. So putting in light of that, for example, David and Jonathan, and I show, you know, how, you know, first of all, I mean, we've distorted love so much. And, and we look at all the examples, you know, of, of David and Jonathan, and we see that actually, you know, yes, Jonathan, you know, said he, he loved David. Well, also King Hiram said that he loved David. Love does not equal Wait sex. Wait a minute, David had two biblical male lovers? Is that what you're saying <laughs> <Right>. now, Christopher? <laughs> so it's very common for people in power to actually express their love for mm -hmm. one another as a way of saying, we are allies and I love you and there's nothing sexual about it. Right. Also, you know, a lot of times people will capitalize or, or pounce on the fact that Jonathan gave his robe to uh, David. Well, we need to understand what that means. First of all, I kind of jokingly say there's something in the in the Old Testament that they did that maybe we don't get today and it's called layering. <laughs> you know, just because he took his robe off doesn't mean that he was naked underneath. He mm -hmm. wore lots of layers. What's the significance of this robe in light of historical context? Well, Jonathan was next in heir to Saul, who was king. And he, his robe wasn't just any other robe equivalent to any other people's, any other person's robe. His robe represented his power. His robe represented royalty. And specifically, his robe represented that he was next in heir to the king of Israel by him taking it off. And if we also read it in literary context, he gave his sword. What, what does it mean when a warrior gives his sword to anyone. So warriors don't even give it to their wives. It's a representation of I am submission to you and I'm in fealty to you. And then even more, when he gives his robe, that's essentially saying, I'm supposed to be king next, but by me handing over this, my royal robes to you, I'm representing that not only am I in submission to you, but I am loyal to you, but I know that you are to be king next. So that it's very, very representative of that whole thing. Nothing sexual about it.